Timothy Bakari Yusuf. Good afternoon, Lagos, Nigeria. Welcome back. Welcome to Borderlines, the only show that takes you beyond borders. We have a very important guest today. Um, it's been a while to try and get him here. He's actually that popular. <laughs> and I'm probably embarrassing him right now, but hey, we tell the truth here, don't we? So my wonderful guest today, let me read his profile to you. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let you know what his profile is. And then I'm going to say hello to him. And then I'm going to start the show with a recording. A particular recording that I want us to all listen to. Right. My guest is Reverend Dr. Montha Isaac. He's a Palestinian pastor and theologian of the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem. Yes, I said Bethlehem. All you Christians, you better open your ears. Yes, I said Bethlehem. You're about to be educated as usual. So, he's a Palestinian Christian pastor and a theologian. He now pastors the Evangelical Lutheran, Lutheran Church, Christmas Church in Bethlehem, and the Lutheran Church in Beit Saho. He's also the academic dean of Bethlehem Bible College, and he's the director of the highly acclaimed and influential influential Christ at the Checkpoint Conferences. Dr. Isaacs passionate about issues related to Palestinian theology. Yeah, no, it's not Sunday. It is Friday. It is borderlines. It is the Friday after Good Friday. Dr. Reverend Isaac, welcome. Thank you for having me, and I'm glad it finally worked out. I'm sorry <laughs> it took a good while. No but, problem uh, at all. It's good, it's good I'm, I'm with you now. This no. is the most important thing. We are happy to have you. Thank you so much for making time out. We know you're extremely, extremely busy and everybody calls on you. I do want to play. Um, we're not ready to play. So before that, that is ready, let me ask, how was your Easter? Juxtaposed uh, with what's going on. How was your Easter? It, it was a very difficult Easter and a very different Easter. Um, it, it's hard to say we celebrated Easter because a celebration is not the first thing that comes to mind in the midst of uh, a genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, we were hopeful. We prayed. Uh, we gathered together as a Christian community in Bethlehem. Um, and uh, it was an Easter that is marked with uh, what we're thinking about Gaza. We prayed a lot for Gaza. We talked about how the Good Friday, uh, uh, in Good Friday, the experience of Jesus is, mm -hmm. is uh, one in which we see solidarity with us. Yeah. Uh, Jesus dying at the cross of an empire, the suffering, uh, and linking it to our suffering as Palestinians, but then the resurrection uh, that gives hope. Uh, so, we dared to hope in this Easter that uh, Gaza will be rebuilt, that this genocide, first of all, will be over soon, uh, and that we will uh, finally enjoy some sense of normality and peace in this land. It's interesting. Most people, in fact, a friend of mine just, what was it? I think yesterday, he was just saying, oh, he's no longer going on his pilgrimage, his Christian pilgrimage to Israel. And then I had to say to him, well, you actually would have been going to Palestine. Would that have been a correct statement? Well, the problem is most people don't understand the reality on the ground and they come thinking it's Israel. They don't understand that um, half of the population are Palestinians. They don't come to the Palestinian side. And even when they come to visit the churches, like the Church of the Nativity, or the Church and the Holy Sepulchre, they don't understand that they are stepping on Palestinian territory uh, and visiting churches that are led by Palestinians. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, when they visit the Holy Land, uh, they imagine an empty land, mm. uh, or they only imagine Israel and the Jewish people, not realizing that uh, Christians exist uh, in this land and we've been here 
uh, for, um, you know, since the beginning, and that we are Palestinian Christians. You know, many are surprised to know we are Arabs. We speak Arabic. Yes. <laughs> um, this is, to, co- to many, comes as a shocking experience. Yes. Um, and the problem is because many of the pilgrims, uh, when they leave, they only build one perception. They only get one side of the story. And for years I've said, we as Palestinians and as Palestinian Christians are ignored. We are literally on the other side of the wall. And I'm referring to the ugly physical sub- separation wall, apartheid wall in Bethlehem that separates us from Jerusalem. But also we are on the other side of the wall to many, many Christians around the world who don't know that we exist and who either purposefully or uh, with ignorance uh, ignore us mm. uh, and continue to ignore our presence and our plight. Indeed. When I came to Jerusalem, one of the things that... So I, I came to Israel, actually, is what I should say. I was brought to Israel as, as a journalist, you know, on a propaganda trip. And one of the places they took us to was Jerusalem, right? And I haven't gotten to Jerusalem. I'm looking around and I'm thinking, okay, I can't see any non-Jewish people. I, I kept looking and looking and I couldn't see it. And then I, I, I went for a walk further down, just about, what, five, ten minutes away to the UN office. And then only for them to explain to me that you're actually in Palestine. That was, a, was an awakening for me. And I think it must be, you know, it sort of aligns with what you're saying, how most people don't know what's going on because we're often told we're being taken to Israel when in actual fact we're being taken to Palestine. Even if, you know, because the border, the 1967 border has actually been pretty much erased. Let's be honest with ourselves. I haven't had a chance to talk to you, of course, since October 7th last year. I'm not going to ask. We, on this show, we don't do that gaslighting where, you know, do you condemn a mass? Because that, that for us is just bad journalism. What I will ask you, though, is how on October the 7th, when you heard what was happening, where were you and how did it affect you? <laughs> I was actually in our school, in uh, one of the schools I uh, uh, supervise and lead the prayers in, a high school with 450 students here in uh, the Bethlehem area in Beit Sahur. And I was leading the morning chapel and my phone was, you know, uh, buzzing uh, with notifications. And one of the teachers, while in the midst of singing, came and showed me, look what's happening. and we were the the immediate response was fear, uh, because we knew that this is a this is not uh, one of the many uh, incidents that I know you know typical incidents that happens here. We realized something big is happening uh, with that will have consequences. But to be honest, I never never in our widest stream did we expect that. Uh, this is what's going to happen first on October 7th, that uh, this many people will be killed from the Israeli side because the Israeli side boasts about the security and uh, and that Gaza is under a very strict siege. So we were shocked by what was happening. Uh, and we're also shocked by the horrific vengeance response of Israel. We never expected this. Uh, we were afraid in the beginning that this is going to become a, a regional war. Everybody panicked. Uh, how will Israel respond? Will other countries be dragged in? So uh, I remember immediately we sent all the children uh, back to their homes uh, early morning on October 7th uh, because we were just afraid and there was so much unknown. And my first... Um, the, my biggest concern on that day was to get the kids back to their homes safely, to make sure that everybody have left the school safely, their parents pick them up. Uh, and then uh, actually, you know, then I remembered my kids are in another school. So I had to go uh, make sure my kids are home safe. My kids were terrified. Mm. Um, they knew that something that a war is going to begin. And um, Hamas's missiles on that day uh, hit parts of Jerusalem, 
Mm. And there was some explosions. So people were afraid, to be honest. Everybody was just very, very afraid from uh, what was happening. Um, it's a day, you know, I think all of us want to forget. Uh, but the biggest thing is what happened afterwards, uh, the six months vengeance campaign uh, since then. Yeah. And let's talk about that six months vengeance campaign. 33,000 plus killed so far mostly civilians yet israel said they haven't they're on a war against hamas i think they've killed perhaps a handful you know of hamas operatives they haven't killed certainly they haven't killed 10 percent of hamas operatives you know fifty thousand kudud's members of the kudud's what what do you expect from the international community because today Every news item this week has been dominated by the seven humanitarian aid workers who were killed. Yet, prior to those seven, 33,000 plus Palestinians and some 70,000 plus are either missing or injured or nobody knows what's happened to them. They just disappeared. Yet, this whole week has been dominated by, the, by Israel's killing of three British, one Polish, one Australian, and one Canadian, um, US Canadian. Talk to me about how that feels as yeah. a Palestinian. And, and, and before I tell you how that feels, uh, I, I really want to comment on, uh, you, you know, something you said about the numbers killed and so on. Uh, we don't know what's you know, the actual number. My fear is that the actual number is more than that. Yeah. This is what most uh, reports we hear from the ground. These are the people they were able to count and identify by name. Yeah. Uh, there are many still under the rubble. Uh, Israel can claim they killed as many militants as they wish. The problem is, and please hear me, because uh, the Western media takes what Israel says as always true, but Israel has a very long track record of uh, misinformation and lying. Mm. We can never take their word seriously. Uh, and they destroyed an entire medical compound, a Shifa hospital. And when they left, they said, we killed, you know, 200 militants. Yeah. Nobody knows, you know, yeah. and no one expects, no one dares to even question the Israeli narrative. Mm. This is one of the problems we have uh, right now. And uh, you, I think you, you touch on something very important, which is the worth and value of Palestinian lives in the eyes of the Western world. Uh, when, uh, and, and let me, let me be, be very clear, every life uh, is precious. Yeah. We're all equal. Every life matters. Israelis, Palestinians, young and old, every life matters. Um, we should never be okay with the killing of any child. Uh, let alone 13,000 now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the world, you know, responded with sympathy and uh, solidarity with Israel following October 7th to the extent that world leaders came from all over the world to show solidarity with Israel. We saw the Israeli flag uh, on major monuments around the world uh, but I haven't seen the Palestinian flag on the Eiffel Tower, on, on the Berlin Wall. And the way politicians talk about the number of Palestinian kills can only point to um, uh, a very deep and embedded racism that exists today. Mm. The extent that they don't see our lives as equals. How else do you explain the silence of the world to the killing of Palestinian children. Uh, and yes, when the seven uh, uh, workers, uh, and we salute their courage, their sacrifice, they are heroes, uh, but every life matters. Why isn't the world concerned about Palestinian doctors who've been uh, assassinated in Al-Shifa hospital? Why isn't the world concerned about the first responders or people who uh, we've seen horrific images of Palestinians going to get the um, aid that was dropped from the sky only to be shot 
uh, dead by uh, Israelis. So mm -hmm. uh, this war, I think, confirmed to us, and to me this is now an established fact, that the Western leaders don't see us as equals. And what's happening in Palestine today points to the deep um, and uh, uh, to the deep racism that exists uh, in, in the Western world today that allows them to normalize a genocide. Uh, and this is what I've said this Easter. A genocide has been normalized in our world. And if we are to understand how and why, I think racism is one of the most, uh, one of the uh, biggest reasons why. Indeed. You mentioned about your children earlier, and we know that, like you said, 13,000 children and more, possibly much, much more. There are many parents who do not know where their children are. There are many children who do not know where their parents are. I'd like you to talk to me about how does this affect the children? If you can tell us the kind of conversation you as a parent have been forced to have to have with your children who are watching their brethren being killed every single day. Talk to us about that, please, Rev. There is now a generational trauma that exists in Palestine because this is not new. Uh, from 1948 onward, we've experienced one a setback after the other and many. Nothing as horrific as this, unfortunately. Uh, this is very horrific, what we're going through right now. And it definitely impacts our children. To be honest, I try to shield them from the news because the images are horrific, but they ask questions. Uh, they try to get a sense of what's happening. They ask us questions, and it's a very difficult answer, a, a very difficult thing to answer as a parent. Uh, the thing, uh, of course, they follow their father, and they know my activism. They follow my speeches. They see me all the time on television. Uh, they understand that something seriously wrong is happening. Uh, I teach them to pray for Gaza, for the children of Gaza. We teach them that, you know, when you have food on your plate today, many, many th thousands don't have this privilege anymore, unfortunately, hundreds of thousands. So we try to use it also as a teaching uh, to, to remind them of the value of everything good we have right now. Um, but the biggest thing is fear. Uh, the fear we have as parents, will this ever happen to us? How will we respond? Uh, we see ourselves hugging our children more these days because we think, will this ever happen to us? Mm. We're, we're very concerned about... Uh, and, and the reason I ask this, because if the world was okay with the displacement of 2 million people in Gaza, uh, what will stop Israel from doing the same in the West Bank uh, if it fits their uh, interest? Uh, this is, again, a genocide has been normalized and we're horrified by this. Indeed. You wrote an open letter to the U.S. way back in May 20th, 2021, and you put in there um, a phrase, good intentions are not good enough. Who were you talking to and what did you mean by the good intentions? So I, I wrote this in 2021 in one of yes. the, you know, had many cycles of violence in Gaza, unfortunately, many wars. And to be honest, what I meant by this is the church leaders around the world who wish us well, pray for us uh, as Palestinians, try to say good things that are balanced, yet never condemn uh, or call out Israel for its uh, breaking of the international law uh, in this war for their obvious war crimes. Uh, and never act to stop the aggression by holding Israel accountable. Uh, right now, uh, I've been very strong in my criticism of churches because, um, you know, they're not even trying to be neutral anymore because everybody condemned Hamas on October 7th. I'm talking about the Western churches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Israel has done far, far more than what Hamas did on October 7th. Where is the church leader who condemned Hamas? Why aren't they calling for that, you know, um, and they call for a ceasefire now, some too late, some have called earlier than others, but that is not enough. I think this war has taught us something very important. It's not enough to say the right things. It's not enough to simply pray or wish for things. We need to put pressure on Israel and hold Israel accountable. 
Uh, the biggest problem right now we have in this land is that Israel has never been held accountable to its war crimes. And uh, two things happened in the last week that I want to highlight in this regard. First, the killing of the seven uh, workers, international workers. And uh, for that, I mean, you have to happen. I mean, uh, even if Israel claims it's a mistake, uh, Israel can afford these mistakes. They, they don't care, you know. Uh, they target anybody and they know they will never be held accountable. This is the problem. Uh, they don't have to be careful. And uh, I think last week an American congressman was filmed uh, saying that uh, Israel should treat Gaza like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In other words, throw a nuclear bomb. This is a congressman. Yes, that's an atomic and bomb. The, yes. Yes. And the scary part is that he's even willing to think and consider this and, and say it out loud. And the scary part also is that uh, Israel can get away with it because people like him will defend that. Mm. And so even today, you asked me what I meant by the good intentions. Uh, we've been hearing so many things from the American administration that they're concerned, they're alarmed, that they told the Israelis way too many Palestinian civilians died and so on. Well, they said this in December. Mm. They said this in November. Uh, they say one thing, but on the next day, they send the weapons. So these good intentions and words mean nothing to us right now. Uh, and uh, it's no, you know, uh, it's clear to us that many of these leaders are directly complicit in this genocide. It's interesting because Joe Biden is a Catholic, right? He is Irish Catholic. Um, and yet, when you, send, when you send that letter and you're calling out all the good intentions, Joe Biden is the president of America, the country that aids and abets Israel's actions of genocide. We can now call it genocide because the UN has finally confirmed that it's a genocide, right? So the, the, there's no plausible or maybe or anything. It is a genocide. We can quote the UN um, Special Rapporteur. Now, when you look at somebody like Biden, for a man of faith like yourself, and you know that here's a man who is Catholic, we're not talking about Trump, who holds the Bible upside down, perhaps intentionally or not. We're talking about, you know, Joe Biden, Irish background, Catholic. What, what would you, have, you, have you ever had, has he ever invited you to talk to him? And if he were, what would you say to him? Especially well, as I, a man of faith. I, I was in the White House in December. Right. Uh, I didn't meet with Biden. I met with uh, White House staff who were, you know, very involved with what's happening. I'm talking about December, you have to remember now, when uh, we tried to call for a ceasefire back then um, in uh, the first week of Advent, before Advent began, so before Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And I carried a letter with me signed by all the churches in Bethlehem, the clergy and the churches in Bethlehem, handwritten, hand signed and pleading for a ceasefire. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the people who work with him on faith issues confirmed to us he's a man of faith, he prays. Um, to me, that means nothing. And, uh, I mean, how can I, how can I accept this when uh, Biden and his administration have been directly complicit in a genocide? He has blood on his hand. Mm. And um, it's not as if he didn't know. And we're not talking, we're, this is not October or November where they thought this is, yeah, I mean, Israel is going to go after those who kidnap the, 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 the people and kill the children and the families. No, it's been six months now. You see that you even admitted that there is uh, indiscriminatory bombing at a certain stage. You know very well what's happening. I mean, America knows too well what is happening. They know the intentions of Israel. And the Israelis themselves told us their intentions. Um, so it's hard for me to accept that 
Uh, a man of faith would do that. I think what politicians today lack more than anything is morality and integrity. The decision to support, to continue to support this war, let's say this, the, the decision to continue to support this war mm. is 100% political decision. It's a decision based on what's best for America's interest in uh, and what's best for America's politics. And uh, it's a decision that's based on the fact that Israel is America's biggest ally in the Middle East. They want to keep their interest. They want to keep what we can call America's biggest military base in the Middle East that brings them weight and balance there. Um, so the support of America to this war is not based on morality or on an ethical decision. It's a decision that is purely about the self-interest of American politics, exploiting the Middle East and expanding their and, and enriching their empire. Uh, it's, an, it's not a moral decision. And the fact that you know, they want to convince us that, you know, I don't want to judge, but at the end of the day, uh, the decisions of this administration have, and the continuous support providing weapons have led to this, uh, the continuation of this genocide against our people. I find that very, very troubling. Indeed. You're speaking to Nigeria, Rev. Let me repeat, you're speaking to your people in Nigeria, and Nigeria is a very religious country, okay? Like Christians, I'm sure, you know, Nigeria actually sends the most, the highest number of pilgrims to Israel. I'm not sure whether you know that, but yes, that's mm -hmm. Nigeria, yes. That's Nigeria for you. Now, many of my listeners are listening today, and they are still wondering, they still believe Palestine is, is Muslim. Palestinians don't like Christians. They still don't agree that Jesus was a Palestinian. I'm going to need you to help me help them perhaps once and for all to understand the relationship. And then we can move on to the other side because I know the text messages are going to come in any moment. Help me help them understand the relationship of Jesus with Palestine. Please over to you, sir. So, so before Israel was created, there was at least 12 to 14% Christians in Palestine. Uh, when Israel was created, Many of us were expelled from this land, ethnically cleansed from this land. Israel not only expelled many Palestinian Christians, Israel also still denies many of those Palestinian Christians, including my relatives, to come back to their homeland, to their homes, not just homeland, homes, houses. Uh, and over the years, because of Israeli policies, our numbers declined as Palestinian Christians. But remember, before Israel was created, uh, we were uh, a sizable percentage of other people. Palestinian Christians have existed for a long time, since the very beginning. Bethlehem, Jerusalem, it's where Christianity started. We've always been here. Uh, and yes, we're Arab Christians today, but that doesn't mean we are uh, in enmity with uh, Islam or with Arab Muslims. We're, we're uh, all Arabs, we're Palestinians, we're neighbors. I think there are two misconceptions about the reality here today. The first is that it's a religious conflict. So let me say it straight. It's not. Uh, it's not a religious conflict. It, the conflict started with the uh, settler colonialism of Palestine by Zionist immigrants, Zionist Jewish immigrants. This is how it started. Uh, it's not as if Jews and Muslims have been fighting here for generations. Uh, in fact, Arab Jews lived in the Middle East in peace and safety. Uh, in dark in, in a stark contrast with European Jews who were always persecuted because of anti-Semitism. Um, the problem began with the establishment of the State of Israel by expelling 800,000 Palestinian Christian, Palestinians. Uh, Israel was not created on an empty land. I think this is what people need to understand. This is the, this is the root of the problem. When Israel as a state was created, Seven, it was created on 78% of historical Palestine. And for that to happen, Israel has to ethnically cleanse 70, uh, 750,000 to 800,000 Palestinians who are still refugees. 
So it's not about two religions fighting. Uh, it's a problem with the cause. And it began when European Jews immigrated uh, with the ideology of Zionism immigrated to Palestine. And the second, it's not an, a conflict. I mean, there is one side that dominates the other. There is no two entities that are fighting. Please understand that. Uh, we've been in self-defense mode since 1948. Uh, we've been defending our land and just fighting to stay in our land since 1948. Uh, um, and as Palestinian Christians, uh, we live in peace with our Muslim neighbors because uh, we're the same people, the same culture. We, you know, we're part of the Arab culture together. We've been living together for fourteen hundred years. You would think uh, we learned how to live together, mm. uh, and we are not as if an ethnic minority or a tribal minority. I think this is another thing that people don't get about Palestinian Christians. You cannot differentiate us from Palestinian Muslims when you see us. You will differentiate me as a clergy with my color, of course. Um, uh, but we don't have a separate accent. Uh, we don't have separate food or different culture or dialect. Uh, we're part of the people. And throughout this recent history, we've been with the Palestinian people fighting for our freedom and independence. Um, so this is, again, uh, I, I wish people tried to ask us. I wish people, you mentioned the pilgrimage. Mm. And what uh, breaks our heart is that many of those pilgrims who visit the Holy Land, as they call it, um, rather than visiting and spending time with the living stones, the people, they focus on the dead stones, the history, uh, which gives them, again, the impression that they're visiting an empty land and all that matters in this land is the old sites. Um, and to us, it's a bit uh, painful to see the hundreds of thousands, if not more, of pilgrims coming to Bethlehem on an annual basis and uh, not even stopping to talk or ask about what's happening. Why is there a refugee camp here? Why is there a separation wall? Why is there a checkpoint? How do you live? How do you worship? How long have you been here, uh, you know, and, and what are the challenges you face? Uh, I wish yeah. I, I could take them to our schools, see mm. the amazing work we're doing, to our churches, to our, uh, you know, the healthcare. We're very, in, in, you know, many Christian hospitals and universities. I wish they come and learn about what we're doing uh, as Christians uh, in this land. Um, sadly, there is, as you said, uh, big misconceptions. Uh, about the situation, uh, and sadly, sometimes I, I meet people who, uh, for example, would say, if you're a Christian, uh, that means you have to side with Israel against the Palestinian Muslims. That's very much a Nigerian thing, yes. But but the idea that Christians and Muslims mean they have to fight, I don't think, why? Why? I mean, even if Palestine was 100% Muslims, does that mean... You know, uh, so the idea that if uh, there is a Christian and Muslim, that then, then they're fighting. Why? No, we're not fighting. Not at all. We're friends, we're neighbors, we're classmates, you know, we're business partners, we're colleagues. Uh, so th th there is this as if presupposition or this, uh, uh, you know, understanding Perception. that. Yeah. Yes, that. Uh, Christians and Muslims must be fighting. You know, even as Christians and Jews, or Christi uh, sorry, Jews and Muslims, you know, right now in America, uh, according to many polls, uh, American Jews uh, tend to support Palestine more than, you know, uh, you would think, not only that, support to Israel among white Protestants is stronger uh, than support to Israel uh, among American Jews. Mm. I hope you get that. Yeah. Support to Israel among white evangelicals is stronger than support to Israel among American Jews. That's fascinating. So even the idea that if you are Jewish, that means you're Zionist, that means you are... It's, it's also wrong. We, we have to check our presuppositions and we have to remember if we put it as a religious conflict... I, that's a problem. I don't have a problem with Jews. You know, I don't have a, if you're a Jewish, I don't have a problem with you because you're Jewish. I have a problem with, with Zionism as an ideology that excludes me as a Palestinian, for sure. But 
there's a big number of, you know, there are more Christian Zionists than Jewish Zionists, by the way. Which is fascinating. <laughs> Very fascinating, yes. So let me, before we move on to the political part, last question for you. There is a bill at the Knesset um, to ban evangelism or evangelical Christian. I'm sure you're aware of that bill. What do you think are the chances of that bill passing? There is a problem among um, fundamentalist Jews with evangelism, for sure. Um, and uh, it's a very fascinating relationship between evangelicals and the state of Israel, because on the one hand, the state of Israel loves the money and the political support. On the other hand, they don't want evangelicals to spread evangelism mm. in, in among the, their society. Uh, so they want uh, uh, one side of the relationship without the other. Uh, some uh, secular Jews also who are very learned and progressive have a problem with evangelicals because many who support Israel fr from the evangelical community in America believe that uh, the, at the end times, two thirds of the Jews will be massacred and the other third will convert to Christianity. Uh, this is how they interpret the end times. Of course, I don't agree with this, but this is how many events. So many, many Jews have problem with evangelicals, but they don't have a problem with the money and the political uh, support. Religious freedom is a problem in, in Israel. And uh, you might be surprised uh, to know that uh, evangelical churches in particular, who are very involved in evangelism, are not officially recognized in Israel. Uh, they cannot, you know, they're not officially recognized as churches. Uh, it's not the same on the Palestinian side, by the way, which comes as a surprise to many. Uh, on the Palestinian side, the Evangelical Council of Churches uh, was officially recognized by the Palestinian president. Um, so uh, Israel is not as many perceive it a beacon of freedom and, and democracy and uh, um, there is certainly uh, uh, strong elements of democracy and elections and so on, but there are on the same time many uh, laws that uh, uh, explicitly favors Jews mm. uh, and privileges Jews. People don't realize that. So uh, the idea of uh, a Jewish democracy, being a state being both democratic and Jewish, uh, it is, you know, many raise concerns about that. How can you, for example, say it's a democracy when the nation state law states that the right for self-determination is exclusive to the Jewish people only? Mm. So this is, this is basically a, a law passed by the Knesset a few years ago. So there are laws that uh, explicitly privileges uh, the Jewish people. And, and that raises questions whether it's truly a democracy. And when it comes to how Israel treats the Palestinians, many studies have concluded that there is right now a system of apartheid. Uh, so it's not just about religious freedom and it's not just about evangelism. Uh, I, I'm talking to you now from Bethlehem. Jerusalem is literally 20 minutes drive from here. Uh, as a child, we used to take a bus that takes us to Jerusalem in 15, 20 minutes. Mm. Right now, I, I cannot go to Jerusalem. Israel bans us as Palestinians. Uh, there is a wall, there are checkpoints. You need to apply for a special permit from the Israeli military because we're under military occupation. And uh, it's very hard to get. Very few people have that. So think of this. I mean... If on Easter day, you as a Nigerian wanted to come and spend time in Jerusalem and pray in Jerusalem, you are able to do that. But I, as an indigenous Palestinian Christian who lives just 20 minutes from Jerusalem, I don't have that privilege. And now it becomes a privilege that comes uh, with applying to through a permit from the Israeli uh, military. Uh, this is what people don't get, uh, I think, uh, when they come to this land. Excellent. Right. I have, I know we've been having, um, the lines have been going, even though I hadn't opened up the lines. 0700-993-993-993. Okay. Let's talk about the humanitarian. Starvation is 
has become, or at least Israel has switched or added to its ammunition to delete in the Palestinian people. Now starvation is one of them. We know that at least 2025 children have either died of starvation or malnutrition. And like you said, probably more because the media can't get anywhere, right? They can't get everywhere they need to get to. What do you think needs to happen with that humanitarian aid? I know Biden had a conversation yesterday with, um, with Netanyahu and you know, they said so-called, quote-unquote, add strong words. At the time, I did wonder why they were making so much fuss about this telephone conversation that was going to happen, at least really was going to be the stop to the genocide. But alas, here we are. They just had yet another type conversation and letting Yahoo promise to stop. Do you believe that he will stop blocking aid from getting into Gaza? Well... Aid and food needs to get to Gaza as soon as possible. I mean, it's really, really catastrophic. I have friends I talk to in Gaza. There's no food. There's nothing. There's no medicine. Uh, a good, you know, a, a friend of mine I talked to in Gaza, his mother died and she became sick and they couldn't take her to a hospital or get any medicine. Uh, so people are literally dying right now in Gaza from the lack of medical support and from the lack uh, of it's it's beyond tragic and uh israel has done that from the beginning from day one the israeli military said there will not be any food or water getting or medicine getting into it. they said that they told us they will do that um and the fact that the so-called strongest person in the world the american president is not able to make israel Get food into Gaza, food and medicine. Tells you something about the state of affairs right now in Palestine. Tells you so when we say that Israel knows too well that they could commit a war crime as obvious as this, denying food and medicine to a population. And they only do it because they know too well they can get away with it. And the fact that the strongest person in the world, the so-called strongest person in the world right now, seems he's not, seems, you know, there are some, uh, is not able to convince or pressure Israel uh, to do so. And to be honest, we cannot take Biden seriously. And this is why. Because he could have paused, if he's serious about this, the sale of this last uh, weapon shipment to Israel until Israel gets humanitarian. He didn't. He chose not to do so. He chose to send the weapons. Mm -hmm. He chose not to have any leverage. Uh, so can we really take him seriously? Can we really say that he's, he... he uh, so it, it, it brings me back to my earlier points. They don't see us as equals. And they're only saying these things because they are under tremendous pressure internally right now. Uh, from many uh, in the United States, and the polls are not doing well for Biden. So he's trying to say these things, it seems, to try to uh, appeal to those who uh, are turning against him uh, with elections coming. This is the only reasonable uh, uh, explanation to why they're telling us now in the media that he had strong words. Come on, strong words. He, he didn't have to make a phone call. All he could do is say, pause the shipment of the weapons. And then Israel would have gone and brought the, the, the aid. Uh, it's so sad. And it's the fact that we're no longer talking about a ceasefire. We're just pleading with the world, get food into Gaza. It's so dehumanizing. It's so demoralizing. It's, 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 it's really sad. It is. Um, I know my calls. I will pick up. I will try and pick up one or two calls. I'm almost done. Um, the UN reports that I referred to, I'm going to read the recommendation. I mean, she did say Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur, she did, you know, conclude that pretty much. I mean, let me just read it. The report finds that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the following acts of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza has been met. So that confirms we know we're looking at a genocide. 
that's number one. I'd like to read a recommendation to you. And then I will, I'll pick up the call because I'll pick up just one call. Actually, you know what? Let me pick up that one call and then I'll read a recommendation. And I want your opinion on that. Otherwise, they will never forgive me that they didn't get to speak to you. Hello? Oops. Hello? Okay, who's going to be the lucky one? Hello? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, uh, Sikiogi. Good afternoon. What's your name? Where are you calling from, please? Uh, you have Emmanuel. I'm calling you from Ekwe. Emmanuel, go ahead with your question, uh, please. I just want to correct some impression. Impression? Uh, I'm a Christian. Okay. But I'm not a blind Christian. Okay. So uh, my heart goes to the people of Palestine, mm -hmm. and in particular your guest uh, today. Can, hold on. Can Reverend, can you hear him? Uh, yes, can you... Uh, can you speak uh, up yes. louder, Emmanuel? I can see yeah. Reverend is straining to hear you. Start yeah, again, I'm please. Saying, I'm saying uh, we still have Christians who are not blind Christians in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an African, and I believe we have our culture. And uh, reading and uh, doing research, I, I, I find out that there are some question marks you know, to Israeli states and even the propaganda about the Jesus uh, some people are uh, giving to us. Um, my heart goes to the people of Palestine, and uh, today I stand with humanity. So I want your guests to understand that there are people who stand with humanity, Thank in respect of their tribe or religion. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you so much. Right. Um, right. You heard that, right? Yes. Yes, you did. Right, so let me, because I don't have time anymore. Sorry, people, I can't answer your call anymore. Um, I'm just going to read out the rec one of the recommendations from the UN report. The special rapporteur urges member states to enforce the prohibition of genocide in accordance with their non-derogable obligations. Israel and other states have been complicit in what can, can be reasonable concluded reasonably concluded to constitute genocide must be held accountable and deliver reparations commensurate with the destruction death and harm inflicted on the palestinian people i'd like your thoughts on that please uh, to be honest i don't know why do we need deliberation why do we need proof why do we need to uh, do, do these long studies the, fa the truth is, is, is evident to all to see. And the people of Gaza are sacrificing everything to broadcast to us scenes of their genocide life. I mean, look at what the aftermath of Al-Shifa Hospital massacre. What more proof do you need? And the fact that food is not still getting into, I mean, it's demoralizing that we still have to have deliberation. I mean, thank God for South Africa, their carriage on the ICJ, Algeria and the UN resolution and others. Uh, Francisca has been doing an amazing work and, and we applaud her uh, and her team, of course. But at the end of the day, do we really need all of this to have a sense of compassion and humanity in us and say enough is enough? How many more children need to die before the world to recognize we need to stop this? And uh, I, I have to come back to the same point. Israel knows they can continue with this war. They responded to uh, uh, the UN resolution for a ceasefire with saying we will get into Rafah. They, they are not giving any attention to what the world is saying. They don't care for a simple reason. They know they will never be held accountable. Indeed. And they know that they have the support of the superpowers who will continue to defend them. This is the problem. Not only defend them, but send them the weapons to do it. Mm. This is the problem. Indeed. Well, I've still got a couple of minutes. I can sneak in one, perhaps two more calls. Hello? 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 Uh, yes, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. I can hear you. What is your name? Where are you calling from? Your and my, your question, please. My name is Sam from Norway. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, um, I want to thank you for the guests you bring. Okay, Reverend. Uh, I had a I had Reverend. Okay. Uh, I, the Palestinians, I want to ask, are they, are they comfortable with Hamas uh, defending them? Okay. Or do they have soldiers of their own? No, uh, because, they don't. Uh, all along, he did not condemn Hamas for what he did. He said he was surprised, they were afraid. All those are the things that are saying. 
you know, the, we have to go okay, to... Okay, you've asked your question. I need to pick up one more call. Yes. I, I will, he can hear you, and I will pass okay. you, but I can answer you that the Palestinians do not have their own military because they've not been allowed to be a sovereign country. Right, one more call, Rev, and I'll come to you. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Sis. What? Okay. Good afternoon. Please, your yeah, name. This is the mach- yeah, the merchant man. man. Very quickly, yeah. please. Yeah. My question is: um, in all this, where is the place of the church? People who have preached the love of God to mankind. Mm-hmm. Where is their place? Because um, I developed this pimples listening to this man. All the while, we have been we have been made to understand that Israel are the people who prepare the gospel of Christ. But at the end of the day, now, I'm see, what I'm seeing, knowing that Bethlehem is in Palestine, then if you mention Jesus in Israel, they would almost kill you. So I'm getting confused. In how this okay. is the place of the church, that, that's my question. Uh, okay, the, the thank okay. you. Right, okay. As you can see, Reverend, we could have this conversation for two hours, and we will have lots, because many people like you rightly said, have been given the wrong impression, right? They've grown up, been indoctrinated in a particular way, and the merchant man, who's one of our regular callers, just said, where is the church in all of this? Where is the place of the church? The other question the gentleman asked before I told, I informed him that Palestine do not have their own military because they've military because they've not been ara- allowed to be a sovereign country. He wanted to know what are your thoughts on Hamas. I'm going to give you two minutes to address both of those. Well, uh, uh, quick, quickly about Hamas. Hamas is part of the Palestinian people. They're one uh, political group. They don't represent everybody, but they are a strong voice and uh, they have some popularity in some areas, less popularity in other areas. Um, the majority of Palestinians look at them as a legitimate resistance party because we're occupied, so we have to resist. I, as a pastor, don't support militant resistance. I support nonviolence. I don't support the ideology of Hamas of trying to establish an Islamic state for sure. Uh, but at the end of the day, Hamas people are my neighbors. Uh, I cannot support the killing of children or kidnapping of children. No, for me, that's uh, something I support. But the the, to deal with Hamas, you need to get rid of the occupation. The occupation is the problem. This is what we are pointing people to deal with. And now we're not afraid to, to say that. Uh, and with the second part, with the one minute I have, uh, I, I, I use this platform, this interview, to call for Palestinian Christian leaders and Nigerian Christian leaders to find the time and, and the space to meet. We need to meet and talk more about these issues. It seems to me there are so many misconceptions uh, with this big number of Nigerians coming uh, on pilgrimage and so on, I think it's really imperative that we have uh, more encounters with one another. And I'm pleading with the church leaders in Nigeria, please come and talk to us, listen to us, engage with us with, before you build any perception or opinions about what's happening in our land uh, today. You would think we know better because we live here. And it's our existence that's at stake. Support to Israel among Christians in the world is putting our existence in danger. And this is my plea. Rev, Rev, I know it's taken us a long time to get you here. You're going to have to promise to come back. The lines are still going. I have so many questions. All the Christian brothers and even Muslims. For more exciting shows from your radio station of the year, 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk. Right, I'm just going to wrap up. Look, that's them throwing me off. Thank you so much, Rev, for coming here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll be in touch about booking another, another time with you. Is that okay? Of course. And to answer more questions, of course. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 99.3 Nigeria Info. We are more than just radio. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Nigeria Info FM. Check us out on Facebook at Nigeria Info 99.3. Follow us on Twitter at Nigeria Info FM and on Instagram at Nigeria Info FM Lagos for live updates as it happens. 99.3.